I am Eric Friedman, and this is Building the Machine. This is Building the Machine, a podcast with operators and entrepreneurs who are building the machine inside of a company to make the flywheel spin. Hi, Dan. Good to see hey, you. Eric. What's going on, bud? A whole lot of fun things. I'm excited for, for this chat. Maybe we start with why you're doing what you're doing. And that'll be a great way to explain what you're doing. I mean, I, I think there are a couple of dimensions. One dimension is a pretty firm belief that starting financial services companies should not be as hard as it is. And that there is demand in the market for a yet another venture fund, but this time focused on functionally day zero companies and financial services. And then a belief that investing in day zero fintech businesses with certain tactical effects can generate a lot of yield for LPs. And then, of course, the ego and arrogance I have to believe that I can do both of those things with some, some in a somewhat efficacious manner. So yeah, that's why I'm running Desians and have now been. It, it, we're coming up on our fourth anniversary. Our fourth birthday will be in August. It's pretty exciting. It's been an exciting four years, to say the least. We've known each other a, a long time. If you had to describe what it is that you you do to, to other people without saying Desians. And without mentioning the company you know you've invested in how would how would you describe what you do i invest in companies that fuck with banks for fun and hopeful profit <laughs> and how do you how do you think about your craft i mean there's so many investors there's so many things you can do we were talking about a little bit before but there's a lot of ways to go about fucking with banks yeah, I mean, I think in today's venture market, there are like four, any given fund or firm or investor has really four things they could focus on. Quality, consistency, velocity, and scale. And I don't think you can focus on all four of them. So any given fund firm investor has to understand which of those they really care about. And uh, Desians really cares about quality and consistency, and we don't care about velocity or scale. And as probably many of your listeners know, there was an incredible piece published by a gentleman from Founders Fund who was talking about Tiger and you know how they're really focused on like the speed and scale business. Incredible article. If 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 your if your audience hasn't read it, they definitely should. And I think there's some real virtues to that. But when I talk to my business partner Ishan about it, I use a slightly different metaphor. I, I talk about Jiro, Nobu, and Benihana. And I think that in the world of sushi, there's a role for Jiro, Nobu, and Benihana. Eric, as you know, I grew up in suburban New Jersey. And in suburban New Jersey, we ate a lot of Benihana growing up. And I, I love a Americanized version of a deeply traditionally Japanese meal. For sure. Who doesn't love Benihana? Who doesn't love catching shrimp in a hat? That's right. Exactly. But, you know, then there's... Nobu and the institution he has built through all of his restaurants in many different cities around, at least in the United States, and maybe abroad, I'm not sure exactly where all of his restaurants are. But that is a luxury brand, but a brand designed with certain scale effects. Um, and it is a brand designed to make you feel good through its choice of geography, how they design the restaurants, the interior design of these restaurants is incredible. The build quality of the restaurants is incredible. 
the consistency of the food you get. And there are certain Nobu trademark meals that you can get at, at his restaurants. And then there's Jiro, who has one restaurant in a train station in Tokyo, but is at the, the height of his craft, for which, you know, there are documentaries made about the level of craftsmanship that he puts into his work. And I think we want to be way closer to Jiro than to be than Benihana. But I think they all have a role to play. And we know what we care about. And and we're thankful that anybody else cares about it in the way we do, because that's not entirely obvious that they will. This is a great segue to something I was thinking about in, in prep for this, sticking with the theme of restaurants. We went to dinner once and you shared with me a lesson that I'd love for you to extrapolate on. You said that true freedom is not having to choose even something as simple as what food you're getting, what wine you're getting. And you, you had me make all the choices with, with the waiter. Can you share more about that and explain that moment? Cause I'll never forget it. I think choice and freedom are often completed. One may even use the word in this context, liberty. There is a certain liberty in not choosing, not having to choose. And I, some, one of the few things I'm really good at is trying to understand where things are unintentionally conflated. So like going to a restaurant and having to choose, well, choosing a restaurant and then going to a restaurant and having to choose what to eat is not, it's a kind of freedom and it's a kind of burden. And I want to just be clear on what are the burdens. You know, Steve Jobs very famously wore the same thing every day because there's not, uh, you know, having to choose what to wear, for example, is it itself a kind of burden and there, there's a kind of freedom in being released from that burden. You know, all day, well, money management is a very odd business because what we are assessed on is, to borrow a phrase, judgment. We have to make judgments all day, every day. And in the fullness of time, we will be rewarded or not reward. We will either get just rewards or not based on the quality of those judgments. And so when I'm not working, there's an immense freedom to not have to make any decisions. Being told where we're going for dinner. In fact, I even love omakase Japanese restaurants because I don't even have to choose what to eat. <laughs> Which is why you shared the, the, the burden of choice on, on, on myself. Although if I recall correctly, you, you did a very fine job. Thank you. That's your judgment on my, my ordering. <laughs> I'm not quite capital judgment. deployment, That's but right. on, on sustenance for Dan. I would say from the introduction here, and many people now get an idea of, of a little bit more about who you are, you represent a personality that's different than many other investors that are out there. Can you share more about why you take this approach? And what I mean by this is a lot of folks are on soapboxes, on social networks and shouting from the hilltops. You take a more tacit approach. Why is that? I joke with LPs that VCs can do one of three things as well. We can be good at generating carry. We can be good at generating fees, or we can be good at aggrandizing our own egos. And we can't do, we, you got to pick one. So, you know, just be explicit about that choice. You know, I'm very clear on what Desians does. And we're in the first book and everything we do from who we, who, who we hire, the way we go to market, how we engage with our limited partners, how we engage with founders. It's all about the primacy of being just very focused on quality consistency and affecting strategies that generate meaningful quantums of carry uh, for ourselves and our limited partners. I think a big part of it is I'm not comfortable with the idea that VCs are that important or that I'm that important, right? Like to borrow another metaphor, I am at most the person behind the soundboard. 
it is the entrepreneurs that are singing their heart out, playing the instruments with a, in a virtuosic fashion, etc. And while there are a few famous record producers, they're far less important to the overall music than the band. And, and in that regard, I'm just thankful to get to hang out with bands all day because they're way cooler than I am. And I, I think there is a way that a tremendous record producer, like a coach with an, a sports team, et cetera, can push people in ways to get the best out of them or get them to express themselves in deeper and more fundamental ways. And that's, I think, a lot of my role in the boardroom or with entrepreneurs. I want to get into some of that how, but to get to that place, you have to have conviction and excitement and judgment such that you are investing in those founders and becoming their, their cheerleader. And I hope you take this as a term of endearment. I think of you as a curmudgeon of fintech. How do you get to that point if you have that kind of a view of, of the world and, and of founders and of this, of this space. So, you know, before we were talking about how there's a lot of, the, the people are not always as intellectually rigorous in how they make distinctions. And one of the ones that really bothers me is how venture capitalists try and conflate what they do as being complicated. Venture capital is not a complicated business. It is, in fact, the easiest business I could think of. We buy securities at one price and hope that we can sell them for a highly appreciated price at some time during the term of our fund because we borrow the money we use to, to buy those securities. But it's really fucking hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, really, really hard. I love the breakdown. Um, Sounds very simple. I mean, difficult. in general, investing is an insanely simple behavior. I mean, there are way, way harder ways to, way, way more complicated ways to make a living. But what we do, right, like if you were to draw a two by two, there's easy and hard, simple and complicated. And venture capital in particular is an extremely simple, extremely hard business. Um, and so... To kind of get back to your question, I think we at Decians have tried to identify what we think of as like the three most important things we need to do to be good at our job and to get the judgment questions correct. I'm happy to share what those three things are. Um, I'm, I'm in fact happy to give away the entire Decians playbook because um, giving the playbook away is not that useful. but. When you do things which are hard and simple, you have to understand what matters and why, and you have to be fucking ruthless in your application of those principles. And there's another dynamic here, which is that the cycle time in venture capital is so insanely long that it's very hard to have any kind of assessment about the outputs of your business. So you really have to focus on process discipline relative to the inputs of your business with a hope and a prayer of being good at the outcomes. I want to dig a little further. I mean, most investors, most people in the startup ecosystem, I would describe as eternal optimists, glass half full. I would not describe you in the same way. I don't know how you would describe yourself, but you know, I guess two questions. Why, why are you that way? And, and, and how do you come to terms with the fact that the sometimes irrational exuberance and optimism of others is the norm. I'm actually largely a techno optimist over many, over long periods of time. You know, in college, one of the things I studied was the history and philosophy of science. And if you look at the uh, progression of the, of humankind over, you know, the span of decades and centuries, the trajectory has been incredibly positive on pretty much every dimension. And, and, you know, you don't have to believe me. You could read Steven Pinkerton, The Better, Better Angels of Our Nature, amongst many, many books that talk about that. And, you know, there are, at least at a high level, certain replicable cycles of human behavior. When you talk about irrational exuberance, I'm reminded of a, 
Keynes has a book, A Brief History of Financial, I'm going to get the name for you in a second. But, you know, there are cycles of, of, of irrational exuberance throughout history in all assets. But those bubbles, they're not permanent. I mean, Carlotta Perez talks about this a lot. And I know, you know, Union Square Ventures has talked about this in, in some depth uh, in their analysis. And so, you know, in general, I am a techno-optimist, as I said, and how I've gotten here is by trying to understand what it is that are like the underlying economic forces that help companies be great. What are the underlying economic forces that create change? Because change creates opportunity. What are the forces that separate the past and the future? Right? If the future and the past have a, some kind of relationship in most contexts, there are places where the past and the future become uncorrelated. That's interesting. And there are ways to assess that around things like demography, technological shifts, et cetera, et cetera. I appreciate the longitudinal answer, but I want to dig into something maybe a little more tangible. Of course. Yeah. You, you and I have, have, have sparred on this topic for a while, which is, you know, the, the new and emerging idea since we talked about it probably in 2016, 2017 of crypto came onto the market in the world. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong here, was that you were not a fan, to put it mildly. How, how has your thinking change there. And, you know, for me, that's a perfect example uh, of maybe a lot of glass half full viewers like myself, and maybe a, a glass half empty view from you. I want to talk about crypto. And then I want to talk about fear and risk. Because what we're Let's talking about is like a distinction between fear and risk. In general, I am not very long crypto. I have never been very long crypto and I've the opportunity cost of the money I've not made on crypto is insane because I first talked about, I first was talking about crypto in 2011, 2010, 2011, because, you know, I've been in financial services for a long time and these kinds of concepts had bubbled up relatively early. I probably could have bought crypto for single digit dollar token uh, coin, uh, coins. But it still doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe in that regard, I'm a purist. It, just because I can buy things and they will appreciate, if I can't understand why people want them, if it, like I'll never invest. And that, for better or worse. I continue to not understand it. I think the metaphor of digital gold is probably the best metaphor I've had for it. I think NFTs are interesting in the idea that I can understand why somebody would want to digitize a baseball card. Like baseball cards are a useful mental model there or other relatively rare assets. I worry about a lot of things around crypto, especially around the power of quantum computers. We've talked about the technological shifts around quantum computing and cryptography more generally, and, and some of those, the opening of new and material attack vectors. But I, it, it makes no sense to me. And, and, and uh, you know, I know a lot of people, um, at one point I had the opportunity to go work at Coinbase. And I mean, I, I love Brian Armstrong. He's an incredible entrepreneur. Fred Ursham, his co-founder is also incredible. But at the time, I didn't understand why anybody would want to buy tokens anyway. And I still don't. To give you another example of this, I passed on the seed, I, I passed on the seed round to Robinhood. And the reason is because I didn't understand why anybody would want to trade. I still don't understand why people want to trade. Trading is a fool's errand. The history of long, over long periods of time, the empirical track record would clearly state that trading is a bad idea. Yeah, uh, for the versus vast, a buy and hold. Buy and hold, index funds, lower your cost. So do you look at that as a a miss or adhering to your your thesis? It's not a miss in my mind, because 
I don't really worry about passes on companies that turn out to be great. I don't worry about my anti-portfolio. Mm-hmm. What I do worry about is are the companies I've invested in going to become great? That's the only thing I worry about. But just to talk a little bit more about this, a VC that you know well, I was talking to him about my portfolio can be chipper cash. And he expressed to me the idea that investing in Africa was, he used the word risky. I would, I think he meant the word scary. It scared him. I think investing in Africa is risky. It's certainly risky. All investing is risky, but it's not scary. Investing is scary because I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I can't measure it. There's no risk. There's no derivatives I can buy around it. There's no pricing I can control about it. There's no way to manage the risk that makes it scary. Investing in a payment processor in Africa is risky because all investing is risky, but we have it's not scary in the sense that you can manage that. And and you can, um, and as you as we've talked about, I'm exceptionally that I was able to partner with the entrepreneurs of Chipper Cash, Hob and Major on their journey. So in that regard, I don't understand crypto. It scares the shit out of me. And I have no framework for why anyone would want to buy it. But then again, I'm not a gold bug and I don't trade stocks. I don't go to casinos, right? Like those are not things that I enjoy at all. Uh, Unlike eating sushi, of course. Are there other areas or categories that you're scared of? I think the way people talk about their businesses, we're in a part of the late industrial cycle where people talk in very loose ways. And that scares me. People so. talk about businesses that are obviously lending businesses as if they take no balance sheet risk or they have no credit exposure. Businesses which are not contractually recurring revenue, and they talk about it in the parlance of recurring revenue run rates. They conflate flow businesses. Uh, they complete usage-based businesses with contractual recurring revenue businesses and so on. And that scares me. The lack of rigor and the lack of specificity concerns me, which is not to say about like any specific industry, but that kind of behavioral phenomenon. Thanks for sharing more. To me, you've always been a, a counterculture thinker, which is to say many VCs like to say contrarian. I'm not a fan of that 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 word because if everyone's contrarian, then then everyone is. How do you come to terms with the new and the bold and never been done before with being against or I guess you know looking at things that maybe aren't going to happen? Crypto is one example, but let's let's park it over there. Maybe someone new that pitches you another idea or something that's going to break the system or fuck with the banks, as you've said, that you've got to get some conviction behind, even though it seems like what they're working on is improbable, if not impossible. You know, I think Benchmark says this the best. Benchmark is the benchmark by which we all probably judge, um, or certainly one of them. And they often talk about this idea of what can happen if things go right. And I think that's really the hallmark of our business. Sitting with an entrepreneur or, you know, some co-founders and thinking to yourself, if this goes right, this is going to become fucking massive. And understanding that what are the quantums of risk we're taking? How do we mitigate those risks? And how does moving from one quantum of risk to the next quantum of risk change the company's valuation, its expected value on a risk-adjusted basis, its ability to serve its audience in a way that delivers on the, the value propositions? As you know, I started a company in 2012 focused on the question of open banking. and. I would say that I think ultimately the ideas that me and my my collaborators at that company developed turned out to be correct. 
and we were just too early. And I, I look at, you know, Cosmo and Urban Fetch and DoorDash and Instacart. And so I think a lot of it is being right at the right time really matters. And you have to do things which, which, as we've talked about, look crazy, but are not. One thing I often talk to LPs about is if you're not doing things which are sufficiently crazy, you'll never generate a 5x net fund, right? You're just not taking enough risk. So you, you don't want to take stupid risks. You don't want to go to Vegas and put it all on black. But if you're not taking enough risk, if you're not scaring yourself, if you don't think it's a little insane, then you should get into growth equity. Maybe to share more for those at home about that experience. You know, what was that company and, and, and what happened there? I know the outcome, but bring, bring us up to speed. Yeah, in 2011 and 2012, I was working at a startup and we were doing payment processing and we were basically emailing Excel workbooks back and forth to our bank partners every day. And this was right when John and Patrick Collinson were, were really getting Stripe going. And it occurred to me that banks would have open APIs. And we started a company called Standard Treasury, which ultimately went through YC and we raised money from RE and Andreessen Horowitz, Index Ventures, et cetera. And ultimately we sold that company to Silicon Valley Bank and it became the genesis of Silicon Valley Bank's open platform approach. And I took on a kind of a senior role helping Silicon Valley Bank think about the future of their interactions with, with startup customers, for sure. But then I look at companies like the Decian's portfolio company, Treasury Prime, or some of its peers. And I, one, Chris and Jim from Treasury Prime are way better entrepreneurs than I ever was. But two, of course, the time helps, right? Ideas that... At the right time, they're building a business that maybe has a different trajectory than standard treasury. For sure. And, and, you know, all the credit goes to the fact that they saw the timing being right now and have pursued a strategy that is that, that takes advantage of the maturation in the market cycle. What made you leave SVB? I think there were a couple things. I mean, SVB is a great organization. I think Greg Becker has built a really world-class organization. I think for me, I am not well-suited to working for others. I, I, I don't know that I've ever been well-suited for that. So that was one aspect of it. And then I think a second aspect of it is I knew I wanted to go do early stage financial services venture capital. And I didn't think there was an obvious way to do it within that context. But, you know, I'm very thankful that I continue to have an amazing relationship with Silicon Valley Bank. And I'm thankful for everything that we did within the organization during my two, yeah, you know, I was there for like two and a quarter years. Thanks for sharing that. I think a lot of uh, VC interviews, especially, people tend to ask them, I think a question that's that's not great, which is, what are some industries or companies that are exciting right now? I always hated getting asked that question, so I never try to, to ask it. But given your filter and view on the world, maybe I'll ask the opposite. You know, what are what are some some companies or trends that you hate right now? You are that you are just not into, and they are not for Dan and not for Decians. Well, I think it goes back to. We want to be an elite venture fund. That means we want to put up 5X net funds. That means we want to be investing in owning non-trivial quantities, generally at least 10% of companies. And we do that primarily through leading financings. But there are like really four things that I look for when I think about what are businesses that have the antecedents of greatness. I'll just lay those out very quickly. Increasing returns to scale, ever deepening moats in a winner take all or winner take most markets that are very large. 
And I see a lot of startups today that I don't think fit those criteria. Can you get specific? I, 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 yeah, I can get specific. Like a company that I'm actually personally an investor in is SpaceX. It doesn't meet those criteria. It doesn't mean it's not a great company, but it's not a great Decian's company. Right. Fair enough. To, to borrow, to borrow, right? Like there are a number of sources of competitive advantage. SpaceX has incredible technological competitive advantage over its peers, and now it has an incredible advantage in sourcing government relationships. So that's great, but that's not like what Decian's invests in. We invest in businesses that tend to have these kinds of business effects that I, I just described. And so, you know, I think there are a lot of companies out there today that are not better the bigger they get. They are at best neutral as they get bigger. Oftentimes they get worse the bigger they get. And, you know, there are businesses that have no moat around them. If, Eric, if I can steal your customers and then you can steal them right back from me, we have no moat around our business. There's nothing... We could be stealing lots of customers from each other, but there's nothing enduring about that. We're not it's creating ever deepening modes. That's an ever deepening road. What you would really want is a business where, uh, for every dollar I spend um, stealing a customer from you, you'd have to spend increasingly large uh, quantities of capital to steal them back, right? Like a dollar today, a dollar twenty tomorrow, a dollar forty the day after. Because if I can spend the dollar to steal them from you, but you have to spend increasingly large amounts of money to steal them back, that's a battle you can never win. Or or un unless you have like infinite capital and a very low cost of capital. Many founders out there who may be thinking about pitching you understanding Decians may look at this as a source of otherwise buried information. What would you want teams to know about you that isn't discoverable from a over-edited bio page or some, some you know, tidbits that may, may help them understand who you are and, and what you're looking for? I think what separates Destians apart from a lot of other VCs and I hope this comes across in this conversation, something you and I have talked about, is that Destians is all about being very real. There's no patina, there's no facade, there's just realness. And a lot of VC, a lot of founders don't want that. If I may, you said before cheerleader, I'm not your cheerleader. I'm not, I'm there to help entrepreneurs see the world as clearly as possible. And in a lot of situations, that actually means seeing things being just completely fucked up. And if you don't want a VC who will tell you when things are off the rails, you shouldn't work with us. If you want a VC who will give it to you very straight, you know, I think we can be a great partner. And I think in today's world where of those four things, speed and scale seem ever more important. I worry that a lot of VCs are going to cut and run on their on the companies that need the most support. Because if all they really care about is raising their next fund so they can raise ever bigger funds and collect even more management fees, uh, I worry about the ability of them to actually work with their portfolio companies or their desire to do so because their incentives have changed. Let's dig into the work you do with portfolio companies. There's a adage that says you should be spending the most time with companies that are successful and at least time with companies that are not. But for many investors, that's not the case. For many board members, they spend an adverse amount of time on companies that are struggling. And you, of course, want to be there for those teams and companies. But how do you think about the split of your time and spending more time with the winners and potentially less time with the quote unquote losers? 
Yeah, I don't necessarily like to frame it around winning and losing. And one of the reasons I don't like to frame it around that is I know incredible entrepreneurs who just get unlucky. And so one of the very first things I tell entrepreneurs is that you should separate who you are as much as possible from the success or failure of your business. The success or failure of a company is not, generally speaking, an indication of the self, your own self-worth. And I think that a lot of people who build companies and it is not successful, it crushes their soul. And I hope that I can do my own little part to help ease the psychic burden of the journey that many entrepreneurs are on. I was going to ask about some of those companies that maybe go down that path, as as many investments do. You know, the companies <laughs> just don't succeed. Just yesterday, I met two incredible entrepreneurs who were pitching me a company, and I told them, "Like, look, guys." Statistically, the likelihood is that this is going to fail. And you have to know that going in. You also have to believe that for some reason, you're, you're different. Like you can be the outlier, right? Or most venture funds return at best 1x net over 10 years. For me to start Decians, I needed to have an insane ego to believe that I can return exceptional, I can put up exceptional performance. And we've talked about this many times, but I still can acknowledge the fact that VC is a terrible asset class if you invest in median managers. And it can be an incredible asset class if you can invest in top quartile managers. Th that's a empirically true reality that I can internalize. Just like when you talk to entrepreneurs, I think they can internalize the fact that the overwhelming statistical likelihood is that they will do, create no value. Knowing that in a power law distributed business, if, the, if they create value, it is likely to be an exceptionally large quantum of value. So that's, I don't, I don't think those things are contradictory, but I think you want to start this relationship acknowledging just the statistical reality and trying to do everything an entrepreneur or investor, board member, advisor to bend the curve in your favor. Because, and especially early in a company's life cycle, if you can bend the curve even a little bit, the compounding will have so many cycles to compound that it can have very profound outcomes. So many firms today have huge teams, services, platform teams, and the like. In my mind, you are effectively a one-person show. How do you think about the balance between those things, those offerings, but also how you spend the, the time and how you go up against what's out there? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm very thankful that I, I do have a colleague, Ishan, Ishan Sakjev, and he joined me as an investor and partner in January of this year. And, and, you know, I have an incredible back office team that probably doesn't get enough credit. Kat, Becca, Ben, the team at Rimmerman, I'm surely forgetting some of them. Chris, the team at Cole Freeman. I think and, everyone's and so, got their service providers, and I'm sure they're great. No, but what but, I mean but, is the but if I may, talent partners, yeah. platform teams, yeah. you know. The, the I'm the face of Decians, but just to be clear, I, I'm, it is not only me. But Decians is the anti-platform venture capital fund. And I would encourage LPs to actually rigorously assess, do on a net of fees and carry basis, platform venture capital firms actually add incremental alpha. It's not obvious to me that they do. And we nobody has shown me a rigorous study which says to the contrary. That, if it um, did, would would it change your opinion in investing in yeah, I, I think platform it, services? I, I mean the leading indicator of that would be I put out term sheets and they're not picked up because entrepreneurs 
choose to work with competitors of mine that have platform services. And that has not happened. That would be a leading indicator of that problem. Um, and if there was ever a time where we started to see that the, the fact that we are not a platform operation by design is a hindrance to serving entrepreneurs or LP as well, we would change that for sure. But there's not any evidence that I've seen that says that that is the case. And I would welcome that evidence. And many of your, anybody who's listening or watching today, please send me that evidence. Dana Desian's DMs are open on Twitter. Please send it to me. This is why I love conversations with you. As, as we head into maybe three rapid fire questions here, it's always a pleasure to get your perspective as it's, as it's unique. I'd love to know a couple quick fire things. What are some of your favorite books? I love 2001 A Space Odyssey. I think that's an incredible book, an incredible film. And I, you know, Arthur C. Clarke's a very complicated guy. And, but I think the vision of the future and the detail orientation of it is incredible. I love a book called Certain to Win. I think that's an incredible book on the application. I, I love looking at how other people in other industries have figured out peak performance. Certain to Win applies what the special forces and the military have used to uh, create and sustain incredible levels of performance amongst the, their organizations. Not surprisingly, I love Danny Meyer's book, Setting the Table. I've learned so much from Danny Meyer and what he's done at the Union Square Hospitality Group. Incredible, incredible. Especially because that business has no moats, right? Like I can get calories at Union Square Cafe and I can get calories at McDonald's. So what is it about a restaurant, do our Nobu, Jiro, Benihana metaphor, what is it about that that creates a feeling of, of, of power? I love... Um, It's going to bother me. I, um, this book, um, Information, a History, a Theory of Flood. That's a great, great book. I love Dune. I think Dune is a really good book. I really enjoyed The Power Broker. As somebody who grew up in the New York metropolitan area, I really enjoyed The Power Broker. And I think seeing the level of detail that went into the making of The Power Broker and uh, I've not yet read the multi-volume history of, of, of Johnson, but I will eventually get to it. That's a level of craftsmanship that is unusual. And I think as somebody, you know, and, and I always admire people who, whatever their craft, have just poured their heart and soul into it. Thanks um, for sharing. We'll put those links and notes and books in the show notes. I will say, if, if I may give one more, Please. I love uh, Michael book on Manchester United and Alex Ferguson, not because I like sports. In fact, you know, I hate sports, but I think that there is a lot to be learned in reading uh, Mr. Moritz's book about Sequoia Capital. And they're the best of the best in our business. Who are some other investors you, you admire? In venture or, you know, in a, let's call it any asset class or time. Well, I've been very fortunate to work with some great investors who I've learned a lot from. Jim Pilata, of course. I'm super thankful for Jim and everything he's done to help me and, and Desians. Nigel Morris at Capital One, Phil Black at True Ventures. Without them, Desians wouldn't be here today. There, there are others who, who really helped me as well. I, I can't, uh, off the top of my head, I couldn't give you a, like a comprehensive list. Um, Three great ones. Appreciate you sharing. And then others that I haven't personally met, but I've learned a lot from Howard Marks. Oak Tree, what he's built at Oak Tree, incredible, incredible, and an incredible writer. I've learned, I mean, anybody who is in our business who doesn't study Buffett and Munger does so at their own peril. The greatest that have ever lived in our business. And, and Charlie Munger is just 
he's a living national legend, a living national treasure, I would say. He has forgotten more than I will ever know, probably. <laughs> Finally, Dan, if you couldn't be investing anymore, what would you be doing? You mean as a, I couldn't do venture investing or I'd have to go get an operating job? The world is your oyster, but you can no longer deploy capital. And we know you're not trading. Yeah, I would probably go be a lawyer. I, th I think I continue to find some of the most important public law questions of our day intellectually inspiring. And internet law, how, like uh, national security law, these kinds of questions are, 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 are big, meaty questions that I think are worthy, uh, would be something I would find a worthy use of my time. If I couldn't do that, maybe I'd go be a ski bum. I like skiing a lot. And, you know, there's like a limited window every year to go do that. So maybe I just like go organ, uh, orchestrate my life around getting 100 days of swim time every year. <laughs> I don't think it's a far stretch for, for, for anybody to see you as, as a lawyer, or at least it isn't for me. But I thank you for the time and going through everything. We'll have some contact information in the show notes for where people can reach you. But truly appreciate you opening up a bit about your thoughts, dealing with some of my fun questions, and sharing more about Desian's Capital. Thank you, Eric. And thank you for everybody who spent the time with us. Thank you for listening to this episode of Building the Machine. I'm your host, Eric Friedman. It would help us tremendously if you were to subscribe to this podcast and rate us in iTunes and share with your friends. Until next time, thank you.